everyone, especially to our prof in Highway and Railroad Engineering, Engineer Willard Dayahan. Good day, sir. For this video presentation, the following topics will be discussed. I will be discussing the first topic, which is the main types of methodologies in the assessment of desirability in economic and environmental or social aspects of constructing a highway proposal. And the other topic will be discussed by my groupmates. Economic appraisal of highway scheme. Economic appraisal techniques can be used to justify a scheme in absolute terms, in which case the decision is made on the basis of whether the project is economically efficient or not. The framework within which this evaluation of the economic consequences of highway schemes takes place is referred to as the cost-benefit analysis. So what is this cost-benefit analysis or the CBA? When considering whether or not to pursue a public investment project such as building a highway or installing traffic lights, the government will undertake a cost-benefit analysis. This is one of the most widely used tools to evaluate, select, and prioritize a project. The main purpose of CBA is to ascertain whether a major investment is worth pursuing not merely for profitability but for the public good. This is achieved by identifying, valuing, and comparing the private and external costs and benefits of the project inclusive of both current and future costs and benefits. If the benefits exceed the cost, there is an economic justification for the project to proceed. The main step in this technique involves the listing of the main project options, the identification of all relevant costs and benefits, and the use of economic indicators to assess basic economic viability. Let us first discuss the identification of the main project options. This is where the decision maker compiles a list of all feasible options that they wish to be assessed. It helps them to determine if the investment into the project is justified and to evaluate alternative solutions based on the real monetary value. This includes the do-nothing and the do-minimum options. Do-nothing option. Basically, from the word nothing, you make no change at all. Everything stays exactly the same. So what does it make in the business or in a project? Well, less change, less cost. Then no change, no cost. On the other hand, the do minimum option offers a more realistic course of action where no new highway is constructed but a set of traffic management improvements are made to the existing routes in order to improve the overall traffic performance. The next one is the identifying all relevant costs and benefits. Many of the benefits of improvements to transport projects equate to decrease in cost. The primary grouping that contains this type of economic gain is termed user benefits. This grouping includes reduction in vehicle operating costs, savings in time, and reduction in the frequency of accidents. So how did these things happen? The first one is the reduction in vehicle operating cost. For a highway scheme, the new upgrades project leads to lower levels of congestion and higher speeds than on the existing roadway. This results to a lower fuel consumption and lower maintenance cost. I'm sure everyone would love this, especially those commuters and riders, for its benefits with a low cost. The next one is the savings in time. We are all familiar with the code time is gold, which can also mean time is money. In the Philippines, congestion is the best reason or example why most of Filipinos' time are being wasted. Well, it happens every day. By upgrading highway installation, time travel will invariably be reduced. Also, the reliability of transport services will be improved. With this, transport users will be able to save their time. And the last one is the reduction in the frequency of accidents. Our next discussion is the use of economic indicators to assess basic economic viability. The economic indicators being stated here are the net present value or the NPV, the internal rate of return or IRR, and the benefit or cost ratio. NPV estimates the economic worth of the project in terms of the present worth of the total net benefits. It can be presented by the formula Net present value is equal to present value of cash inflows minus the present value of the cash outflows. The most important rules to remember here are, if the NPV is greater than zero, then we invest with the project. But if the NPV is less than zero, 
then we do not invest with the project. The next one is the IRR. IRR considers what discount rate will be needed to produce an NPV of zero. While the benefit or cost ratio, it is based on the ratio of the present value of the benefits to the present value of the cost. Our next discussion is the economic life, residual value, and the discount rate. Residual value is also called the salvage value or scrap value. It is the amount to be recovered at the end of an asset's useful life. When we are talking about the residual value, we are thinking about the property plan, typically fixed asset or depreciable asset. On the other hand, discount rate translates all costs and benefits to time equivalent values. It is a collective discount rate reflecting a project of benefit to a large number of people and spanning a time frame greater than one full generation. Now, we are down to the advantages and disadvantages of cost-benefit analysis. The advantages of CBA are Number 1. It facilitates comparisons between alternative highway proposals and hence aids the decision-making process. Number 2. It offers a broader perspective than a narrow financial or investment appraisal concentrating only on the effects of the project on the project developers. Number 3. It helps to figure out whether the benefits outweigh the cost and it is financially strong and stable to pursue it. The last one is, it is suitable for all projects, small or large. While its disadvantages are, number one, potential inaccuracies in identifying and quantifying costs and benefits. It increased subjectivity for intangible costs and benefits. Number three, inaccurate calculations of present value resulting in misleading analysis. Last one, a cost-benefit analysis might turn into a project budget. Let's move on to the payback analysis. Payback analysis is an extremely simple procedure that is particularly useful in evaluating proposals. The method delivers an estimate of the length of the time taken for the project to recoup its construction cost. The method assumes that a given proposal will generate a stream of money during its economic life, and at some point, the total volume of the stream will exactly equal its initial cost. The time taken for this equalization to occur is called the payback period. The following formula enables the payback period to be derived. Environmental appraisal of highway schemes While the cost-benefit framework for a highway project addresses the twin objectives of transport efficiency and safety, it makes no attempt to value its effect on the environment. Environmental evaluation therefore requires an alternative analytical structure called environmental impacts forming the assessment frameworks, which are air quality, cultural heritage, construction disturbance, ecology or nature conservation, landscape effects, land use, traffic noise and vibration, pedestrian, cyclist and community effects, vehicle travels, water quality and drainage, geology and soils, and policies and plans. This together with the economic assessment, would form the decision-making framework used as the basis both for choosing between competing options for a given highway route, corridor, and for deciding in absolute term whether the proposal in any form should be proceeded with. The approach to appraisal, or what we call NANA. Each of these scheme was subject to a new form of assessment that incorporated both the COBA-based economic appraisal and the EIT-based environmental assessment. Within the method, all significant impact should be measured, whether possible assessment should reflect the number affected in addition to the impact on each. It is desirable that all impacts be measured in quantitative terms, though this may not be always feasible. Within the NATA framework, the impacts of transport projects are categorized in terms of five high-level criteria reflecting the government's objectives for transport. Each of these criteria are divided into a number of sub-criteria. It is against each of these sub-criteria that the impacts of a proposal are assessed and presented in appraisal summary table or AST. There are five divisions of criteria. Number one is environmental impact, which noise, air impact, landscape, biodiversity, heritage, and water are included. Number two is safety. Number three is economy. Number four is accessibility pedestrian. 
And number five is integration. Let's proceed to the next topic, which is basic elements of highway traffic analysis. The functional effectiveness of a highway is measured in terms of its ability to assist and accommodate the flow of vehicles within both safety and efficiency. In order to measure its level of effectiveness, certain parameters associated with the highway must be measured and analyzed. First, discuss the speed flow and density of a stream of traffic. So, this topic, it has the formula of Q is equals to U times K, where Q is the measure of the volume of traffic on a highway. U is the average speed for all vehicles in a given space at a given discrete point in time. K is a measure of the numbers of vehicles. Because flow is the product of speed and density, the flow is equal to zero when one or both of this term is zero. It is also possible to deduce that the flow is maximized at some critical combination of speed and density. The next one is speed density relationship. So it has a formula of u is equal to c sub 1 exponential relationship quantity of negative c sub 2 times k where c sub 1 and c sub 2 are constant. The speed density relationship is linear with a negative slope. Therefore, as the density increases, the speed of the road rate increases. On the other hand, a certain researcher, Greenberg, observed nonlinear behavior at each extreme of speed density relationship. When density is zero, the free flow speed equals constant 1. When speed is zero, jump density is infinity. Flow density relationship. The density of maximum flow is equal to half the jump density. So, in grabbing the flow density relationship, the flow density relationship is parabolic concaving the Speed flow relationship. Maximum flow is equal to free flow value times jump density all over 4. So, just like the flow density relationship, the graph of this is parabolic but concaving to the left. Going to discuss the topic determining the capacity of a highway. After this lesson, we're able to understand the level of service approach, determine the maximum service flow rates for multi-lane and two-lane highways, sizing a road using the highway capacity manual approach, and we're able to learn about estimation of AATD for a rural road in its year of opening. There are two different approaches to determine the capacity of a highway. The first, which I will be discussing later, is the level of service approach involves establishing from the perspective of the road user and the quality of the service delivered by a highway at a given rate of vehicular flow per lane of traffic. The second approach puts forward practical capacities for roads of various sizes and with carrying different levels. Let us now try to understand the concept of level of service. Its formal definition is it is a quality measure is describing operational condition within a traffic stream, generally in terms of such service measures as speed and travel time, freedom to maneuver, traffic interruption, and comfort. There are six levels of service that are recognized, designated from A to F. Level of service A is the best operating condition, while F is the worst. In order to determine a road's level of service, a comprehension of the relationship between early volume, peak air factor, and service flow is vital. Early volume is presented by a capital letter V, which is the highest early volume within a 24-hour period. PHF or peak air factor is the ratio of the early volume to the peak 15 minutes flow presented with V sub 15 enlarged to an R value. In order to get the value of PHF, we need the value of early volume divided by peak 15 minutes flow multiplied by 4. And for service flow, it is equal to peak 15 minutes flow multiplied by 4. Maximum service flow rates for multi-lane highways. The Highway Capacity Manual generates maximum flow values obtainable on a multi-lane highway given a certain speed limit and prevailing level of service. 
Ideal condition is met when there is no heavy good vehicles, buses, or recreational vehicle on the road. The driver population consists of regular weekdays, and driver's end road is divided by a physical barrier. Given the existence of ideal condition, the maximum service flow rates is defined as maximum service flow is equal to C sub J times B over C times N, where N is the number of the lanes in each direction and C sub J is the capacity of the standard highway lane for a given design speed. Maximum service flow rates for two lane highways. The capacity of such highway is expressed as two directional value rather than one directional value that is used in the previous section for multi-lane highways. Under ideal conditions, the capacity of a two-lane highway is set at 2,800 passenger car units per hour. If one adjusts this value by a ratio of flow to capacity consistent with the desired level of service, the following formula for service flow is obtained, where service flow is divided by 2,800 times the quantity V over C. The table shown the level of service values per two-lane highway under ideal conditions. When conditions are non-ideal, the capacity of the highway reduces from 2,800 PCU per hour based on the equation shown above. Sizing a road using the highway capacity manual approach. When sizing a new roadway, a desired level of service is chosen by a designer. This value is then used in conjunction with the design traffic volume in order to select an appropriate cross-section for the highway. The annual average daily traffic or AATD for the highway is multiplied by the term called K-factor such that DHU or design highly volume is equal to K factor times A A D T. K corresponds to the highest annual hourly volume. Finally, since D H U is a two-dimensional flow, flow in the peak direction is estimated by multiplying it by a directional factor D. D D H times D is equals to factor K times factor D times A A D T, or annual average daily traffic. Estimation of AADT for a rural road in its year of opening. The selection of the appropriate layout for a rural road requires that the highest and lowest forecast for the opening year is estimated. The traffic was split into the following five categories shown above. AADT or annual average daily traffic is measured in vehicle per day. Basically, this is what we get if we count data 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, in both direction for 1 year and then dividing that sum by 365 days. This gives us average vehicle per day.